Hello, everyone. I'm Tamara Banks. Mitch, so great to be back on the show with you today. It's good to see you, Tamara. Um, we have a special guest, Dr. Shannon Beckman. Nice to have you here. Thank you for having me. You bet. Tell us a little bit about yourself and the work that you're doing with the Right Start for Infant Mental Health Program. Sure, I'd be glad to. Um, so I am a licensed clinical psychologist um, with specialized training in infant mental health and child development. Um, and so in my current position at the Mental Health Center of Denver, I oversee our outpatient infant mental health program where we serve um, pregnant women and children ages birth through five. Um, many of the families that we treat um, come from low income populations. Um, they are sort of typically an underserved population and they um, have a number of stressors. And so we help um, children and families to kind of weather those storms. How much are children really affected by what's happening around them? They're actually affected a great deal. Um, so sometimes when I tell people that I do infant mental health work, yeah. they kind of look at me a little funny and sort of raise an eyebrow. Um, and I think there's um, kind of a misperception out there that um, if you know unfortunate things happen in infancy that they're young enough, they're gonna forget about it. Um, and actually what we do know is that children, um, very young children, greatly take in what's going around them in their world. Um, and unfortunately, they can and they do experience trauma. Um, actually, children as young as nine months of age can experience the full range of criteria for post-traumatic stress disorder. Um, and so a number of the families that we work with have um, involvement with child protective services. There may be um, issues of child maltreatment, abuse, neglect, uh, witnessing domestic violence, or other issues that they've experienced. Um, and so my program um, works to really help the children in the context of their relationship with their caregivers heal from the trauma and the adversity that they're experiencing. And you mentioned as young as nine months old yeah. or nine months young, they can actually pick yeah. up that stuff. Yeah, and people, so we, I often will get a, a, you know, the question about, well, can they actually remember the trauma? Yeah. Um, and so the interesting thing about trauma is that um, obviously when you're a, a very little baby and you're an infant, you don't have the capacity to encode verbal memories the way that you and I do as adults, so they don't remember the way that you or I would. Um, however, there's this saying that the body keeps score, mm -hmm. that although the, the memories of the trauma may not be verbally mediated, um, the children do uh, hold on to the experience in terms of body memory or sensory perceptions. Um, and so, for example, if um, children have witnessed domestic violence, what sort of their encoding is, um, the maybe the look of horror on mom's face as she you know as she's being hurt or if they're in mom's arms they're encoding um sort of the proprioceptive input of being shaking around or maybe being thrown against the wall um, if there's an earthquake they're encoding sort of the shaking and all of the vibrations that are going around we actually have a um a client that we're treating on our team right now who um, when he was a little little guy um, his mom um, had substance abuse issues and he was strapped into a stroller um, and mom was under the influence and he actually went down a flight of stairs. Mm -hmm. um, and so again, he's not gonna necessarily have the verbal memory of what happens, but for him now two years later, he is playing repeatedly out young children falling um, down either stairs or sort of falling from cliffs. And so it's clear that he remembers um, and there's a lot of research that shows that um, even when traumas happen, when children are pre-verbal, that when they acquire language, the, it actually does come out verbally, either through, through play or they are talking about it. So we do know that they can and do remember. Yeah, we'll talk a little bit more about how that plays out as uh, teenagers and adults mm -hmm. in just a bit, but I'm, I'm curious if you can talk about what, what do then children need in that very fragile point of life to really have a, a stable um, emotional development? So the biggest thing is relationship. Um, so one of the kind of core premises of infant mental health is that all of child development unfolds within the context of their primary caregiving relationship. 
Um, and so all of the treatment that we do with our um, young children is within the context of relationships. So really what they need um, is loving, stable, nurturing caregivers. Um, and actually the number one predictor of how very young children will fare following a traumatic event is the functioning of their primary caregiver. Um, and so if we can support the caregiver in concert with the child, um, the child has a much better um, likelihood of, of weathering the storm of the trauma. And sort of jumping all the way to adulthood, you can see, Mitch, probably a lot of the people that you've had to deal with in, in um, uh, trials, a lot of those folks probably didn't have what Dr. Uh, Beckman is talking about. No, that's, the, you know, it's well, and the one thing about this, it's, it is fairly well researched. Early childhood development really does play a role in if you were going to end up being in a delinquency situation or if you can end up in the long-term incarceration as a result of some of the things that happened to you very, very early on. Um, there are groups, for instance, of young children that have been studied now within the period of the years, you know, preschool years for 30 years now. And those that had the appropriate relationships, those that went to the appropriate pre-K schools and early childhood development, you know, they don't come into our system. They didn't come into our system when they were 15. They didn't come into our system when they were 18, when they were 25. The other group that they studied and have been studying that long, they did come into the system. They were at-risk kids. The other thing that we know, for instance, is that you know, if a nurse practitioner goes in during the pregnancy, make sure that the baby is born in a healthy environment, physically, emotionally, uh, parenting skills are taught, that relationship is built, those kids don't come into our system. So we're learning more and more about this. Mm -hmm. And what we're starting to do in the law enforcement area is that when we're going into, for instance, a meth house, and we see that there's kids there, it used to be, okay, call the people that collect the kids. Mm -hmm. right. And now we have a drug endangered children program because those little children are one exposed to all kinds of toxic things needles and things they may have crawled around in but also we know that the mental health aspect of it needs to be addressed so we do that there and then domestic violence like you've talked about too and our Rose Andam Center that we're in the process of building we know that the trauma is not just the person that's getting abused, but it's the people that are exposed to it. If you look at studies of child abuse, for instance, sometimes the child that witnesses the beating of their sibling suffers much more post-traumatic stress than the child that's actually being whipped or being beaten, that type of thing. I'll never forget in the Chandler Grafner case, the little boy who was uh, starved to death in the closet, he had a little brother a little half-brother, and uh, he had to listen to his brother beg him to bring him food. Mm. And the one thing he told us, and just a, you know, maybe a kindergarten kid, but this had gone on. He said, I knew if I brought him food, I'd be in the closet too. Mm -hmm. And so he, even though he didn't suffer the abuse and he didn't starve to death, he didn't die, that little boy needs some help. Right. And... Uh, so uh, the, we are getting a lot better at what we do when it comes to the secondary victims of the crimes that we see. And it's because of the doctor and the, and the programs like this that have opened our eyes to not only the immediate impact, but the long-term impact. Mm -hmm. I mean, if we're housing a young person in prison, because of something that we could have prevented, something that we could have gotten them treatment for 20, 30 years ago, gotten them in the appropriate environment, then it's worth the investment to do that. It's much cheaper than to have somebody suffer, um, a victim suffer, those types of things. So, you know, that's what I like about what we're doing these days. You know, 30 years ago when I started, and we didn't pay a lot of attention to this, but right. I think we should, and we really need to. So sort of segue into that, um, Dr. Beckman, what, um, how does this manifest itself? What, what happens to a child as they become an adult? Well, even before they become an adult, there are sort of significant um, things that we can see. Um, so in the immediate aftermath, we'll often see a lot of post-traumatic stress symptoms. Mm -hmm. 
Um, so we'll see our very little kids. Um, these are the ones that are getting expelled from their preschool and early learning centers because they're taking kids out on the playgrounds. They're being very aggressive. Um, these are the kids that have um, sort of the unrelenting high intensity tantrums that just cannot be relieved. Um, they're also, you know, these are the kids that um, when they come to our clinic, they're very frightened, they're very hypervigilant, they're very aware of their surroundings. Um, and it's like they're always on guard because mm -hmm. what they have come to expect is that the world is an unsafe place, that people are dangerous, and that people can't be trusted. And so part of our role in the work that we do is to kind of disconfirm those expectations and to help children see the world in a much more be benevolent light. Um, without intervention, however, um, things can and do persist. So there's actually um, a great study that is getting a lot of um, kind of attention right now. It's the ACEs study, the Adverse Childhood Experiences study, and it's probably one of the biggest um, investigations and collaborations. It's between um, Kaiser Permanente and the Center for Disease Control, and they studied um, a large group of um, adults who were going in for a comprehensive physical and they retrospectively asked them about early childhood experiences of abuse and neglect and household dysfunction. Um, and then they sort of correlated um, the health and mental health outcomes with early experiences. Um, and what they found was a very strong and graded association between the number of adverse childhood experiences um, and later life health and mental health problems. So the more adverse childhood experiences you had, the more likely you were to see um, not only mental health problems, but actual physical health. So things like heart disease, um, COPD, there were higher rates of STDs. Um, one of the kind of most most shocking findings was actually premature death. So on average, people that had the more and more adverse um, early childhood experiences had on average 20 years off of their life than those that had not been exposed to that. Um, so that's all to say that um, early um, childhood environments and the caregiving that they receive has a huge effect not only on the immediate um, kind of presence of how children are doing, but in the future as well. Mm -hmm. Can can really mm -hmm. uh, feel some of the negative and positive things mm -hmm. that, that happen. What happens in terms of treatment? What does that look like for a little one? Sure. So, um, again, when I tell people what I do, they're like, oh, you do infant mental health. You must you teach parents. You work with parents. Um, so infant mental health is really synonymous with sort of treating relationships. Mm -hmm. um, so when we have a little kid that may have experienced either abuse or neglect or some other trauma, our goal is really to treat the child in the context of their relationship. Um, and so all of the work that we do, it's called dyadic. So we have a dyad. A, typically it's a mom and a baby. Um, sometimes it's a dad and a baby or a grandma and a baby or a kinship provider. Um, but our focus is really um, to help the child heal through that caregiving relationship. Um, and so, you know, we as providers and um, people offering treatment are, are going to be very temporary in that family's life. But what really who is going to hold the baby and child moving forward is the family. So we really work with the dyad and the parent to really help heal some of the symptoms and the trauma that we're seeing. What if there aren't adults involved? Sometimes that unfortunately does happen. Um, so for the most part, there is usually a caregiver. Um, so my team, the Right Start team at um, Mental Health Center of Denver, we really don't discriminate about caregivers. So we'll work with a kinship provider, we'll work with the foster care provider, um, really whomever. However, sometimes um, there are children whose parents' rights have been terminated and they may be in a foster care placement um, and that caregiver really isn't interested in participating and they might not be the long-term adoptive home. And in those cases, we will do individual therapy with the child. It's typically um, all of our work sort of involves play because again, when children are as young as they are, when we treat them, they don't always have language or it's not always um, sort of readily accessible to them. And so we help them tell their story and process the trauma through play. Um, so kind of one of the cardinal symptoms of PTSD in very little children is what we call post-traumatic play. 
So it's um, the child's way of really trying to resolve the trauma and master it and make sense of it. Um, but sometimes it just gets stuck and you'll repeatedly see, um, you know, the domestic violence being played out and everybody dies. Um, and so our goal is to sort of help that child um, kind of make meaning of what's happened and then to offer an alternative ending where eventually the child can genuinely feel that they are safe, that they are loved, that the world is a safe place and that there are caregivers out there um, that are nurturing and loving. I'm sure every case is uh, different and individual, mm -hmm. of course, but roughly how long does it take to sort of get to that threshold? Sure. So um, it varies. Again, um, some families can come to us um, and have very quick treatment. So it really in part depends on the trauma itself. Um, it depends on um, the pre-level functioning of the child. So for example, we have occasionally we'll have a case where it's a very well-functioning, loving, stable family. We had one where um, the family's little like Honda or Toyota Prius was hit by a semi-truck. Um, and so the child had a lot of PTSD symptomatology where he was refusing to go in cars. He was terrified to be in a car. It was this huge production. Mom couldn't get to work, couldn't do anything. Um, and so we had maybe 10 sessions with them. Um, again, that's a very discreet trauma that is likely to not be repeated. And um, the caregiving relationship was largely loving and secure. And he had um, was very well adapted kind of coming into it. And so that's kind of best case scenario where it's pretty short term. Um, for other children that have had um, lives where it's just sort of chronic ongoing, either violence or witnessing domestic violence or chronic um, comorbid types of abuse, whether it's neglect and physical abuse and sexual abuse, the treatment can be much longer. Mm -hmm. um, in my team, we tend to use two treatment modalities. Um, most of the time we use something called child-parent psychotherapy, as well as parent-child interaction therapy. Um, and on average, again, averages, and there's always differences, but on average it takes about 10 to 12 months of treatment. And Mitch, having folks like Dr. Beckman work with your office, that's got to be helpful, um, I, I would imagine. Well, it depends. You know, obviously, a, a very young child like that that is abused is nonverbal. So, as far as being a witness, that type of thing, yeah, you know, we're we're more about the 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 bruises, the impact, the you know, that type of the physical part of that. But I think that a big part of what we do now is about victims' compensation, is about getting victims' treatment, that type of thing. And so I, I kind of touched on it in the early part of the show, is that we, we take a different approach now. And when someone walks in and in, they're presenting a domestic violence situation, we triage their situation. Okay, who's at home with you when this is going on? Oh, you have this baby. Well, where was, you know, and... And so the whole idea then is through collaboration to bring in experts that can have an impact on that infant. That infant may not be our direct victim in that situation, but that's somebody that we know needs help mm -hmm. and somebody that we know may eventually, because of this negative aspect of what they've gone through, come into our system. So I think the good news out of this is that we're recognizing it in law enforcement, that we're triaging these situations. If it's a meth, it's a mom with a meth addict, and she's asleep, she leaves these babies unattended, you know, the police are paying attention to that. We have a program now. Get them in the hands of the experts. And I think the good news is that over the course of time, over 10, 15, 20 years, we're going to see the positive impact of that. We're going to have healthier people in our community, both physically and mentally. And I think we're going to spend less money incarcerating people. You know, um, I'd love to get put out of business. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I'm sure the people that run the penitentiary would love to get put out of business too. And these steps that we're taking today, I'm just, you know, I'm at the end of my career. Um, but to see this kind of thing develop over time, and start to have an impact, I'll probably be a real old man. But I just think what we're doing now is really positive for our community and for our country. Absolutely. 
Dr. Beckman, what is, um, when it, we talk about resilience mm -hmm. in the context of childhood trauma, what does that mean? Um, so resilience is, is a, a wonderful concept that we, um, that as mental health professionals, we really like to promote. Um, it really has to do with the ability um, to overcome hardship and adversity, um, and more than just overcome it, but to thrive. Um, and so the one point that I will like to make, I know we've been talking about a lot of grim sort of things here, but that um, most children who experience a trauma don't all go on to develop post-traumatic stress. Um, many people have, um, even if they're living in low-income neighborhoods and have a number of stressors, they also have a number of what we call resiliency factors. Um, again, the number one of those being um, caregiving relationships, which is why, again, all of the treatment that we do in my team is really to promote the caregiving relationship um, because we have seen children that have come from very dire straits to go on to do great, wonderful meaningful things that contribute to society. Um, and when you look kind of back at their childhood and their past retrospectively, um, we can identify some resiliency factors. Um, often what we see is that there is one person in their life, whether it was their parent or a teacher or a mentor or a coach of some kind that took an interest and kind of took them under their wing. Um, and that's really what we know children need. They just need one solid person on their side. And to drill down a little bit more on that, is there a way that we can promote that resilience? Yeah, so there are. Um, there's actually an entire literature on resiliency. Um, and the way that we really think about it is sort of at three levels. Um, and sort of going back to that ACEs study with the adverse childhood experiences, one of the things we learned from that is that um, as the number of experiences and stress levels increase, um, the greater your likelihood of developing issues. So the first way we promote it is to try to reduce exposure to risk. Um, and so we do that um, with things like prevention. So um, as Mitch was referencing earlier, it's things like getting nurse family partnership into homes so that moms don't have low birth weight babies, which is a risk factor. Mm -hmm. um, in addition to um, kind of trying to reduce risk, we also want to increase the assets, so increase these factors. Um, one of the biggest things that my team does very frequently um, is we enroll kids in Head Start or in high quality early learning centers um, because there's nothing more beneficial that you can do than to put a child that may be coming from a violent, unsafe neighborhood right. in, for eight hours of care into a very loving, safe, um, stable environment with loving teachers that are trained in child development and that can really wrap around that family. They get food there, they get meals there. They really get hope um, there. They get yeah. hope there. And there, there's a lot of hope that you provide. I'm so glad that there are people like you to take care of those little folks who sure. don't get the assistance. Thanks so much for Absolutely. being with us, Dr. Beckman. We've been talking with Dr. Shannon Beckman on this edition of Dialogue Denver DA with Mitch Morrissey. I'm Tamara Banks. Have a good day. Denver 8 TV, your city, your source.